with that, let's get started with the panel. So we have four panelists today. Um, the topic for this is careers in accounting. Um, so panelists, I'll go ahead and let you introduce yourself. Uh, Jason, how about you? Sure. Uh, hi, my name is Jason Lucio. Uh, I am a sole practitioner uh, that works mostly uh, doing consulting for small businesses as sort of fractional CFO, some management consulting, and um, a lot of project work. Had my license for only about five years now. Thank you. Um, Sarah Burgess Finley. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah. I'm a senior international analyst at Epicor Software Corporation. Um, I focus on our EMEA and APAC groups. So I'm um, working with the foreign controllers to do foreign tax returns, um, booking our foreign provision, and um, all of our transfer pricing as it relates to those regions. Um, I've been licensed for a year now. Uh, my one year anniversary is coming up. Yay. <laughs> Perfect. And Sarah Laughlin? Or La, La, uh, Logan. 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 Yes. Logan. Hi, I'm Sarah Logan. Um, I'm a senior managing consultant at BKE, which is a, um, a regional CPA firm. I work in our nonprofit advisory services service line. And so we do basically everything except audit and tax for nonprofits, either on an ongoing basis or um, on a project basis. And I have been a CPA since 2001. So y'all are making me feel old. <laughs> I've been a CPA for almost, it'll be 20 years. Wow. Um, coming up in November. So okay. awesome. So I'm like also a CMA and a CFE. So if you have questions about those certifications, I'd like to know about that too. Perfect. And uh, lastly, but not least, Tracy. I'm Tracy Howard. I am the controller at Entra Institute, which is kind of a um, startup education group. Um, I just just moved over to this job a couple weeks ago. So um, I let's see. I've been a CPA since 2009. I think that's right. Um, so for a little while, um, I'm primarily kind of in the controllership, finance director, um, that space, um, small company, and then was at a mid-sized company and then kind of came back to a smaller company. So, um, excited to be here and, and chat with you guys and see what we can share. Perfect. Well, I have some questions to get us started, but as we're going through, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and then we can uh, assign that out to our panelists as, you know, if, whether it's a general question or maybe you have a question for a specific panelist. Um, so to get things started, I'll, I'll pose this to all of our panelists and uh, we'll go in reverse order. So Tracy, we'll start with you. How did you end up in your current role? And did you plan for this role early in your career? Oh, um... Let's see, I, th this is a good one. I'll go through these. So I, I, I didn't plan for any of this early in my career. I, I didn't know what I was doing. So I went to, um, I got my master's in accounting at UT. Um, prior to that, my undergrad degree, I always laugh. I'm like, I'm the only person, one of the few people in the world that has a bachelor of arts in computer science. <laughs> um, I went to a liberal arts college, but um Got my master's in accounting at UT and kind of spit through the program there and went and worked in public accounting um, at Deloitte. I think I generally knew at that point that tax wasn't the way I wanted to go. Um, and so I kind of went the audit and um, controls. SOX was really kind of big back then um, on testing. And so went that route. And then I always laugh. I... Um, my job after I got out of public accounting, I was traveling and, and was ready to be done uh, traveling. And I interviewed for a senior accountant job and, and a controller job uh, on the same, same day. And I got the controller job and didn't get the senior accountant job, which seemed really strange to me. It makes a little more sense to me now. I will clarify, the, the senior accountant job was at a larger company um, and their theory was that I didn't have as much accounting experience as what they wanted, um, which 
now that I hire for senior accountants, I know kind of what that means. Um, public accounting is a great experience, but you you got to find somebody when you're getting out of public accounting that's willing to kind of train you in actual accounting. They're very different. <laughs> um, so I got hired as a controller at a small company um, and kind of and worked up a little bit there to finance director and then realized I needed to learn more accounting um, because I was doing a lot of operations. You will, you will find that a lot of controllers in smaller companies, and maybe Jason can attest to this, you end up doing HR and IT and, you know, kind of all of those things. Uh, so went looking for more accounting knowledge, ended up at Mood Media, um, which is a mid-sized company, picked up a lot more accounting knowledge there, and then realized I kind of missed the operation stuff. Um, and so came back to a smaller company. Um, I guess that's kind of the path. It wasn't anything I specifically set out, although I will say I now, the biggest thing I will say is try to think of the areas of accounting you like, whether it's tax or accounting or audit, and then, you know, kind of move through a couple of, I, my feedback, I think I stayed too long at my, my middle, my middle job. I was there nine years. Um, and, uh, it's definitely worth getting multiple experiences because you learn so many different things from other companies um, and then start honing in on where you ultimately want to be. Um, that's kind of where I took this job because I want to be in that smaller company world kind of doing all that back office stuff. So, okay, that was my long answer. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Logan. Sure. So I, um, I did a little bit of planning, but not when I was young. So <laughs> I, I went to Schreiner University, which is in Kerrville. Not a lot of people know where that is. And so when I got out of school, I was competing with UT grads for jobs and um, I had no idea how the hiring process worked. All the whole thing about internships and mixers and whatever. I was in Kerrville. Like, where was I going to do that? So um I ended up just sending resumes out all over the place and ended up at a small firm in Houston, which was very fortuitous because I learned more in my two years auditing at a small firm than my peers were learning in five years at a big four firm. Like I learned the ins and outs. It, they happen to specialize in nonprofits. And so I, I wasn't being picky at that point. I wanted a job that could pay the rent. And I was like, I'll learn whatever they're willing to teach me about whatever industry we're in. Like, I'm not gonna be picky about it. Let's just go do some work. So I um, got into nonprofits there. It's really interesting. It's very rewarding to help um, organizations sustain their mission by the work you do. So um, I learned a ton in two years. I um, followed a guy to Austin, got rid of the guy, kept the job. Um, and <laughs> was at the Diocese of Austin here for a few years and the Catholic Diocese and then moved on to Concordia University, Texas. And I was there for almost 13 years and left as the CFO um, June of 2019. And then while I was in that position and in the positions before I did, this is where the planning comes in. I saw a need, like there's a need in the nonprofit community for consultants who can come in and help with some of the administrative functions because nonprofits are run often, they're often created by people who are really good at whatever mission they serve, right? So it's the program people. And then if they wanna sustain that mission, they have to look to administrative people and those are harder and harder to find. Or you don't invest in the right administrative people because you wanna put all your money in programs. So. I saw that need was there. I was gonna do it on my own. I ran into someone from BKD at a conference and was just telling them, like ran a seriously random person in line for food. And I was telling them what I wanted to do. And they're like, you know what? We just started doing that. So let me set up an appointment for you. So advice number one, always talk to people in line for food, random people, just strike up a conversation. Um, two interviews later, I had a job as the, the champion for the Austin San Antonio um, practice unit for nonprofit advisory services. So that was two years ago. It's going okay. Oh. 
So I think that was the planning, that was the extent of the planning was really seeing, understanding myself and where I could add value and really trying to find where that niche was in the market where I could fill in there. So. Perfect, thank you. And Sarah Burgess? Yeah, I feel like I was in the same boat. I didn't plan for any of this early in my career. I think I just uh, accidentally fell into accounting and then accidentally fell into tax. Um, but like Sarah Logan said, um, I started also at, at a medium sized firm. So a lot different than starting at big four, but you do learn a lot of different things that you would not learn starting out on big four. And I think it really gave me an opportunity to advance my career very early on. Um, by the time I graduated college, I already had three years of public accounting experience. <laughs> um, and, and I was starting out already in a senior role pretty early. Um, I ended up, uh, because of COVID going back to school, I was like, oh, I have all this free time. We're not driving to work. You know, I can't go anywhere. So I ended up uh, applying for um, law school to go back to get a degree in international tax law. And, and it's funny because going back to school, I was like, oh, it'll give me a niche. I'll be able to use this in my current career. And then I started school and realized, oh my God, this is nothing. You're not going to use it in your current role at all. Um, so if you want to do this, which I did, I really liked it. It was really interesting. But if you want to do this, you're going to have to go to like a global corporation or a big four firm or one of these firms that specializes in transfer pricing. You would have to go definitely somewhere else. Um, so that is what I did. And um, it's interesting because I actually just made this career move um, at the very beginning of this year. So I worked for five or six years in public accounting. And this is um, my first big industry experience. And it is the best decision that I could have made in my career. Um, I, I, this is literally the happiest I've been in a job. Um, and although I'm not helping clients anymore, um, I really, really like the work that I do. It's extremely interesting. Um, and, and I'm just learning so much. It's crazy. It's almost overwhelming. Um, but yeah, total, total accident. Didn't plan for this. <laughs> so yeah, advice would be be open-minded. Um, and like Sarah said, uh, take advantage of different opportunities. And, and if you are not happy in an area of accounting, don't, don't stick it out for nine years to realize that that's not what you want to be doing. Um, you know, definitely dip your toes in, in other opportunities because there's so much to accounting. Um, it's not necessarily just audit or tax, um, there's a lot of different roles that you could uh, go into. Perfect, thank you. And Jason. Yep, um, so out of college, or I guess during college, I thought I was gonna be an economist. That was my dream job was to work at the Department of Labor for some reason. Uh, and I could not get into grad school, <laughs> which is like, looking back on it, it's pretty hilarious. Um, so I went to work right out of college um, in accounting, worked in business and industry for, I don't know, 15 years uh, before I sort of maxed out into how far I was going to go in my career without a license. So that is what was the impetus for me to get the license. Now, as far as consulting goes, I always knew that I would be good at it and that I wanted to do it, but I didn't have a plan for how I would get there. So I can't say that I planned for it. It was a goal, but I had no real pathway that I was actively working towards. Um, and the, the way that I ended up falling into it was through um, a bunch of networking relationships. Really, all my clients are referrals or people that I have worked with previously um, on nonprofit boards and through volunteer work. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the early part of my career really developing my professional network and now is really where it's starting to all pay off for me. Um, so the, this was always the goal, but I never had a plan for how I was going to do it. And um, somehow I laid the groundwork for it to happen. Perfect. Um, I didn't see any questions come through in the chat yet. So I have more that we can do. But if anyone does have any questions, um, feel free to post it. Um, so I think this will be a, a quick one for all of you. Um, and Sarah Burgess, we'll start with you on this. Um, what is something unique about your current role? Oh, you're on mute. 
Oh man, I feel like that's like the quote of the last two years. You're on mute. Um, no, uh, sorry, something unique about my current role. Um, I feel like 50% of what I do is something that nobody's ever heard of. Um, it's uh, called transfer pricing. And um, it's basically these rules that surround transactions that are between related companies and how you have to account for that uh, in different taxing jurisdictions. So when you're looking at different countries, and you've got different uh, tax rates in different countries. Um, there are rules that make sure that companies don't take advantage of like lower tax rates in different countries. So um, it's extremely unique uh, trying to navigate those rules while also tax planning to try to have the lowest effective tax rate <laughs> possible um, while kind of maneuvering these rules. Um, and it's kind of a mixture between economics, uh, law, it's a little bit of accounting um, and uh, social skills because I have to work with people in 130 different countries and 130 different cultures. Um, so it, it definitely is, is different, <laughs> but it's fun. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Jason, how about you? Uh, I would say the uniqueness in my role comes from really the freedom to be able to do what I want to do when I want to do it. Um, when you work for yourself, it's really, it's because it's only you, you're making all the decisions. So um, every day is different, but the uniqueness is really in that every day is different, right? And I get to choose what kind of engagements I take and what kind of engagements I turn down. I get to choose um, how much I work and when I work, and in many cases, where I work. Um, my sister-in-law, a couple of days ago, she called me, she's like, hey, she's uh, in sales. She's like, I have to go to London next week. Do you wanna go with me? And my brother was like, who can just like pick up and go to London? I'm like, I can. <laughs> I mean, I can't next week because I do have something that's due, but yeah, I mean, I can, I'm the type that I can just sort of pick up and go um, because I, I do have that freedom. So I would say that is probably the most unique thing about working for yourself. Perfect. And Tracy? I'm, I'm thinking on this one because I'm still learning uh, in my new role, but I'll say, you know, just generally the thing about accounting that's so interesting and why I was saying like kind of move around roles a little bit is, um, it's all accounting, so it's all based the same, but it, there are a lot of different aspects of it, um, you know, and things to learn and pick up, uh, different industries, different companies, the way things work. Um, so there's, yeah, I love, I pick up new things all the time. Um, so I'm doing that. I would say, so my current role is also is a fully remote role. Um, I know that's kind of the topic of the world of, you know, whether you go hybrid or remote or back in the office. And I don't know what you guys are seeing out there in the jobs that are um, that are hiring. Uh, it's kind of different. So um, for me, as I've early in my career and really before COVID, I would have never said I would have said I'll never work remote. Um, I like going to the office, but um, I, I don't know if things have changed. Uh, I have little kids at home and it is so much easier to not spend an hour on the road commuting two hours each way. Um, Austin's nuts and I get so much more done. Um, and really my teams, we have daily standups and, you know, have really good connections and, you know, we try to get together every once in a while if we can, but, um, I, so I don't know. I, I would say I feel like for me, it's a really good place. I don't know if I was starting out in my career, how I, I feel bad for some of these kids that, you know, were in their, not kids, young people in their first years at public accounting that, you know, spent it all in their bedroom working 12 hours a week or whatever. I think that's probably kind of rough. So 12 hours a week, 12 hours a day. Sorry. <laughs> Perfect. And Sarah Logan? I think one of the things that the unique about what I do is I sit kind of in between audit tax and industry. So it, with some of my clients, 
I have a client I've been with the entire two years I've been at PKD. So we are very much embedded in their organization. We get to know them. Um, we, I see them, I saw them physically twice a week before COVID, but now I see them twice a week. Um, and we've worked through a lot of things and we've grown a lot together. But the other aspect of it is, you know, that's kind of what I got tired of as a CFO is the same thing over and over. So I also get the opportunity to do projects, right? So I think Jason probably has some of this too, where the, some of it is ongoing, but some of it is projects and you can get in and do a thing and fix something and achieve something and get out and be done with it. And so that's a whole different kind of feeling. So I think it's kind of unique in that I get to do both. And that's not necessarily something you would get if you were only in industry or only in audit. Um, tax is all projects generally, <laughs> but yeah, it, uh, it, it's kind of unique that way. Perfect. Uh, we have our first question in the chat from Mary. Uh, for those of you who've worked in public before, what was the most beneficial and what was the most challenging about it? And Sarah, we'll, we'll pick, kick back to you. Sarah uh, Logan, sorry. Okay. Um, when I worked in public, so I'm in technically in public accounting now, even though I do, I do consulting for a public accounting firm, which is the weirdest mix of things from an operational standpoint. But um, had I gone straight into industry, I would have missed the big picture. So doing auditing for two years really opened my eyes. Like it helped me bridge that gap between here's all the pieces you learn in the textbook and then here's all the operation stuff that goes along with it that connects it together. That if I'd gone into industry, I may have been siloed in one area of the organization, or if I had um, if I had just stayed in audit, I'd been all over the place. But you know, you really in audit when you're learning an audit, you really do get to see, especially at a small firm. I don't know about a big four, but even at, at BKD, a, a mid-sized firm, you get to see all the way to the financial statement presentation and, and working through that process with the directors and the managers, um, the senior managers, thinking about the presentation of it, what it's being used for, and then getting all the way into the weeds with the, um, with the, uh, the client. And so when I was ready to move into industry, I had seen so many different things that worked and didn't work at clients that it that informed the way that I led when I went into industry was because I already had such a smattering of experience across different organizations my okay so this is how I would in my mind now kind of looking back how I think would be an awesome way to like play out a career would be while you're in college or like while you're in school get a job doing AP, accounting, like get some job in that world just so you sort of get to actually use an accounting system, like use a tool, book a journal entry, like do some of those things. So you have some, then, you know, either stick with that right after college, but at some point it is, there's value to, you know, kind of what Sarah did, said in, in doing public accounting in some form or the other, because the other thing you really learn out of that is what auditors are looking for, um, which is super helpful when if you go back on the industry side to figure out what you need to prepare or have for the auditors or half the time you then get another young person coming to you asking for something and you're like, but well, that's not what you really want. What you want is this and let me tell you why. And so kind of both that that is in my vision it's do some accounting first because i didn't have any exposure to accounting really and um like i mean when i came out like i was saying about coming going from public into industry you know sometimes they're like have you ever booked a journal entry no i never actually booked a journal entry and i i will tell you i would sit in public as an auditor and i'd be like god this stuff is a mess how do these people get their books so messy? Like what, how, I don't even understand. And then you go on the other side and you're like, oh man, weird stuff happens all the time. Like, <laughs> so that's my, 
that's my kind of, I don't know how I would play things out if I could. I would say that the second question, part of that question or what is the most challenging, and this is not a snippy answer, keeping track of my time in 15 minute increments is the most challenging part of public. So annoying. Okay, Sam's shaking his head. Yes. <laughs> the first room that I worked at, I kid you not, we had to book to the six minute. Like it was literally like you were booking appointments. Wow. It, it was so terrible. Like, yeah, it, I mean, you spend half your time trying to. That's why I traveled so I could get on the big projects that yep. weren't so neurotic <laughs> about the budgets. <laughs> yeah, that you could book a whole day too. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I think um, just to answer that, also, one of the most challenging things about public accounting is. Um, at, you know, at the staff level, right, at the lower level, you're working with multiple managers, and I feel like, I don't know if it's just me, but every place I've ever worked, every manager does it differently, so you have to not only know your client and what's going on with them, and you probably, if you're in the detail, you know the client maybe even better than the manager, um, but you also need to know how your manager wants it, what are they looking for, what's their style, how are they going to review it, it's going to be, you know, if you've got six or seven different partners you're working under, you know, how do they want it? Um, so that can be a little challenging also. <laughs> Jason? Yeah, it's weird because technically I do work in public accounting, even though most of my day-to-day -day feels like it's um, industry. The most beneficial thing I would say is um, the satisfaction of being able to help a client resolve something, you know, if it's project-based or helping them, you know, become more efficient or answering a question that they have long wanted to know the answer for. Um, I really like developing those relationships and feeling like I'm helping them um, be more successful. Uh, the most challenging thing is probably just the breadth of things that can come at you when you work in public accounting. You know, a project can look like anything really um and more specifically in in my world it's um being um what is the word just being open to on any given day i'm gonna just have to work with whatever accounting system they have so a client comes to me and says hey have you ever worked on this no is that a problem probably but no i'm gonna figure it out <laughs> you know like i just I've worked in so many weird, you know, like industry specific accounting systems. And of course there's quick, but you know, all the major ones, but at any given moment, I'll be like, I don't know, how do you, where's, where do I get to the bank balance in here? Uh, so that's probably the most challenging. Well, they're very, very insightful about the, the uh, you know, any different, every, any different day could be a different software or something you kind of got to figure out on the fly. Um, mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, Tracy, we'll start with you for this. Oh, oh uh, McKenna's got one here. Uh, what are some non-accounting soft skills that you wish you would have developed earlier in your career? And then are there any technical skills slash software you would recommend sharpening yourself up on? So kind of a two-part question. Tracy, we'll let you take that one. Um, you know, the, the easy one, I mean, the easy one was always time management, right? Um, you get into that with tracking time. I mean, you're always trying to figure that out. Um, for me, another one for me was like, is managing a meeting. Does that make, so, so one of the things I do, and, and that's completely different in virtual world now, but, um, you know, I, when I had a larger team would kind of go through and have in our daily, you know, somebody else facilitate the meeting daily. So you just get that practice of, and you guys will probably laugh at now, but opening the Zoom meeting for everyone, right? Can you do that and make sure it starts on time? Um, so it's like opening the Zoom meeting, hosting, welcoming people in, running an agenda, actually having an agenda, um, taking notes in the meeting, and then sending out follow-up afterwards. So, you know, I'll put some of that in the communication bucket, which is something that you don't necessarily learn in school. But um, I, in my second job, worked for like a diehard executive um, who was, you know, if the meeting starts at three o'clock, it starts at three o'clock. There's no small chat, you know, it's, we get down to business. 
Um, and if it ends at four, it ends at four, right? Like he was diehard about a lot of those things and those communication. And I learned a lot there. Um, and so I will, I, I'll say kind of working through those things um, and realizing not to say yes for everything. Um, kind of seeing Brian's up there because you took too many, too many things on your plate. Um, and then on, so, I mean, obviously you guys are all going to be experts in Excel. And I guess they teach that in schools now. Like um, one of my staff, you know, came out of school and was saying, oh yeah, I have an Excel class in there. Um, it was probably, and I mean, all the accounting tools you'll pick up later. Okay, I'll turn it over. Uh, Jason, how about you take this one? How do you take it next? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, for me, the most important soft skill is being able to communicate uh, clearly and knowing really who, how to tailor what you're saying to who you're talking to. So yeah. if I'm talking to like a business owner who perhaps has some knowledge of what accounting terms are, that is something different than if I'm talking to, very often I work with my clients, they have a separate T, uh, CPA that works on their tax stuff. And so I'll have to work with that CPA. Um, and that's a different type of conversation, right? Uh, managing client expectations. It's all, it's really all about the communication is if I can make sure that I'm saying what needs to be said and the client is understanding it in the way that they need to understand it, that is a success for me. And also the other way that if they're trying to tell me something, am I really understanding what they're saying or what they're asking me for um, so that they feel heard and they feel, you know, that they're getting what they need from me. So communication for me is probably the number one soft skill that has been the most important. And it leads right into the second one. I don't really think I'm a great technical accountant. And, you know, that's one of those things where it's like, there, there's always going to be somebody smarter than me, better suited for me for whatever, whatever project you need. There's somebody out there who's going to be better than I am. But where I feel like I set myself apart is I truly view myself as a people person. And uh, for folks who aren't accountants, they, you know, it's, they're just different. You know, I work with a lot of like creative folks, um, like in advertising is one of my industry niches. And yeah, you know, they're really creative, but they're not necessarily great, you know, business people. Uh, and so I, I, I am always uh, cognizant of knowing that I'm not necessarily going to be the smartest person in the room, but when you have your license, you know, clients expect you to know sort of everything about everything. And we all know that really, you know, a little bit about a lot of stuff. And so I don't have to have the answer to everything. I just need to know when I need to be like, oh, I need to look that up. I will get back to you, right? Because all the technical stuff, I can look at it. I can find it somewhere. I mean, I had to do, I had never done a consolidation before. I'm like, well, it was in my accounting textbook from advanced. And I went and hauled that thing out. And that was how I did consolidation for the first time. I didn't know how to do it, but when she brought it to me, I was like, eh, I could probably figure it out. So I don't, ha I don't, I don't feel like the technical in many instances, at least in what I do is as important as the soft, because I am also a business owner, right? I need to make my clients happy to have repeat business or for referrals or whatever. And so I view the soft skills as really where I set myself apart over the technical, the technical, I think we can, we can figure it out. We can look it up and we can figure it out. So whatever sort of niche you're going to put yourself in, yes, there's going to be technical stuff that you probably should be better at than other stuff, but I would focus more on the soft. Do you mind if I listen to it? Oh, no. So I was going to say, um, along the lines of communication, I think there are a lot of different different forms of communication and, and the different ways that you can manage that. One of the things that I learned that I should have learned earlier was um, being more self-aware about what I need and how to articulate that and how to manage up. That's a word I've just learned. But um, when you're coming in at an entry level or at a mid-level and you're, you're getting all these tasks thrown at you, you really do have to think about where are my strengths here? Am I using my strengths or do I need another resource? And then standing up for yourself with that resource. So, be, but being able to articulate to your leader that there are things you need from them as well as a leader. So um, 
in public accounting, a lot of that could look like I need somebody to review this thing and I need it reviewed probably a day from now. I need to figure out how to get my partner to not be so busy so that they can actually review this thing. So working on those skills of really managing up and figuring out how to communicate with different people and being flexible with that. We've got some directors who like when you put things on their calendars and some who are like, nope, I manage my own calendar, send me an email. And being able to be flexible with the communication of styles of the people around you um, and drawing those boundaries yourself about your communication styles and your needs. So something somebody told me a long time ago um, when I was burning out at a job was if you set boundaries and you are um, vigilant about those boundaries and you are consistent with those boundaries, then people will start to respect them. Whether it has to do with work-life balance or tasks you'll take on or whether, whether you will gossip at the water cooler or not, um, <laughs> whatever that boundary is, set it and be consistent with it and people will start to expect that from you and then they'll challenge it less. So that, that's a, a, it's a skill though, it takes practice. And Brian, I have, I have a, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have a quick story that I think highlights what Sarah just said. Uh, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years ago, I, was a con I had started a new job as a controller for a global company. And like my first or second day on the job, I got an email from IT that said, hey, your cell phone is ready. Just swing by when, you're, when you want to pick it up. And that had, it had not been brought up to me at all before. So I was like, what do you, what do you, mean, what, what do you mean my cell phone's ready? They're like, well, you know, all department heads get a company-issued cell phone. And I was like, yeah, so I went to him and I was like, why? And he goes, well, you know, it's your department head. And I said, well, I don't want one. And he's like, what do you mean you don't want one? I said, I don't want a company issued cell phone. What happens if I just say no? And he's like, uh, why would you say no? And I said, because if I'm not here, I'm not working. I don't want people to think they can contact me in the evenings and weekends. Like when would there ever be an accounting emergency? Have you guys ever seen that episode of Friends where Ross gets the pager and they're like, why do you need a pager? It's like, come quick, they're still extinct. There's like, I and never in my life have I ever encountered a true accounting emergency. So I just told them, I said, I don't want a company cell phone. Thank you. <laughs> that was it. And from then on, they knew like, if I'm in the office, okay, I'm working. But if I'm not there, no, I'm not available. Sorry. So that's how I set that boundary with them. The perfect, perfect story, Jason. And want to make sure we save some time for the networking at the end. So this last question, I'll, I'll say kind of rapid fire, try to Try to give it a two sentence answer if you can. But thinking about work life balance, and Jason, you actually gave a fantastic example. But work life balance, and then for those of you that, that you know have been in public a little more recently, if you can focus on that piece, how do you? What are what are some things you do to help you maintain that work life balance? Sarah Burgess, we'll start with you. <laughs> this is an unfair question. Um, Gosh, I don't, when I was in public accounting and it wasn't that long ago, um, I feel like firms try to preach that they have a work-life balance. And if you work in tax, that's probably a lie. I hate to be a pessimist, but there are going to be tax season and there's going to be not tax season and you will get your balance made up for outside of tax season. You're just going to work a lot in tax season and just know the light at the end of the tunnel is that your workload is going to be extremely light for like half the year and you're going to be able to have all kinds of flexibility to take vacations and stuff like that. But for several months out of the year, you, you probably are uh, going to work a lot. So you just learn to kind of plan your year accordingly. Um, and it helps you get through it. <laughs> Sarah Logan. I'm sorry. I was dealing with a child issue and I missed the question. I'll, I'll go no worries. It's, uh, in a quick answer. How, how do you ensure that you have work-life balance in your role? Um, <laughs> you may have just seen that. Um, so <laughs> trying to get a kid off to dance class on here. Um, I, I think, I think work-life balance is a myth. It's all about priorities. And so how do you set boundaries so that you can be present in the place you are wherever you are when you need to be. So how do I set boundaries with work 
so that I can be present when I'm at home and not thinking about work. Of course, my work is in my home right now, so that's a little bit different. Um, don't put your office in your bedroom. Just don't do it. Not good for your mental health. Um, the, but yeah, it's, it, when I'm at work, I need to be focusing on work, which is really hard when you're at home, but um, it can be done. And, it, it, and just how do you organize your life? You use calendars, you um, communicate well with the people in your life about what those boundaries are and what your needs are at different times. And just give yourself a lot of grace. Um, you're not going to be, you, you can't be 200% of a person, right? So you've only got so much of you to give at a certain time. It's really the question of which, which task are you prioritizing? Which relationship are you prioritizing? So. And then Tracy, we'll, we'll let you round it out. What are, what's quick answer? What's something that you do to help you maintain work-life balance? Um, I, a couple things. So I prioritize that five to seven window with my kids. Um, I get off and do dinner with them. I will say before we worked from home, I would, and I was diehard with this with my team, even, you know, that didn't have kids was like, we would decide ahead of time, like, we're going to work late these two nights this week. Right. Um, and so then everybody could communicate with their whoever it was that they needed to communicate with that we were going to work late on, you know, Tuesday and Thursday during close or whatever. Right. And so then, you know, my husband knew then on those days I would work late, late, um, and get stuff done. And then on the other days I would make sure I got home for dinner or things with my kids. Um, I think that that's one that's helped me balance. You'll figure those out as you go along. The other one is just thinking about what job do you want at what point in time? I mean, that's one of the reasons I made a job change, right? Some jobs are not 40 hour a week jobs. And if you sign up for that and then your life changes, you might need to change jobs because the role is probably not gonna be a 40 hour a week role, so. Perfect, well, I see more questions coming through, but again, I wanna save time for networking. So Linda's gonna start to move us out into our breakout rooms, um, should be, four people that are in a room i think with one exception i think we have an odd number of pairings so linda's going to go and, and move everybody through you have about 10 15 minutes to network meet the other mentors mentees you know discuss the panel that's your 15 minutes to use as you'd like so thank you all our panelists this was fantastic um really really appreciate all the insights everyone was giving hope everybody enjoyed it um and with that we're going to move on to the networking